All right, it's 4.30, so I would say let's get started. Our next speaker is Alex Lex, and he will talk about the visualization of omics data. Alex is an associate professor of computer science at the Ski Institute and the School of Computing at the University of Utah. He runs the Visualization Design Lab, which develops visualization methods and systems to help solve today's scientific problems. Before joining the University of Utah, he was a lecturer and postdoctoral researcher at Harvard University. He received his PhD, master's, and undergraduate degrees from Graz University of Technology. And in 2011, he was a visiting researcher at Harvard Medical School. He's a recipient of an NSF Career Award and has received multiple Best Paper Awards and honorable mentions at IEEE VIS and ACM CHI and other conferences. He also co-founded DataVisson, a startup company developing visual analytics solutions for the pharmaceutical industry. So thank you for coming, Alex, and please take it away. Yeah, thanks, Jana, for the introduction. Um, hi, everyone. I'm glad to be here. Uh, I'm talking something that is very dear to my heart. I've been working in visualization of omics data and more generally biological data uh, for most of my career. And so I hope I can kind of like show you some of the things that I think are really cool about this field. Um, I would love to have this be an interactive session. So if you have any questions, just interrupt me. I'm monitoring the chat. Uh, if I miss something in the chat, I would ask that some of the moderators just like bring it up and interrupt me. Uh, so yeah, if you have questions, just jump in um, and we will discuss them right away. So um, I just wanted to say, um, give credit to uh, my research group. Um, some of the work that I'll be showing is, is, is um, my own. And like, actually, when I say my own, I mostly mean my students. Um, and, and so credit to them. This is like a picture of the last pre-pandemic outing we had. Uh, so it's not quite up to date, but you, you get a sense. Uh, we are a group of people who do kind of like applied visualization research in Utah. So today I want to talk about omics visualization. And um, this is like a huge topic. Um, you can essentially like omics and genomics is, is, is like it's independent field of study, right? So there's like only so much that I can uh, tell you about in an hour and also talking about visualization at the same time. And so basically what I'm saying is take everything what I'm saying with a grain of salt. Um, I'm like, if I'm talking about tasks or data types and so on, there's always more complexity. There's always more questions. There's almost more nuance. So I'm just trying to simplify a little bit um, to fit this into like an hour. Um, and I want to talk about omics visualization from three perspectives. Um, there is like the, the genome coordinate perspective, uh, which I also call the structural perspective. How do things like lock together in the genome? Then I want to talk about tabular form. This is all about, let's say you have something like gene expression data and you have multiple conditions, one treated, one not, or you have a population and you want to discover differences in that population. So you have like large tables with genomic data and what you're mostly interested in is, is analyzing those tables. And so there I'll talk about tabular visualization. And then finally, the, the last perspective I want to talk about is the network perspective. Um, and networks are really important because those um, essentially determine function in the genome. Um, so for example, if you, if something like uh, a cell dies that happens because there's like a cascade of, uh, of chemical reactions going on in a cell um, and, and that is modeled in networks. And if I wanna understand that, I need to look at the network and at some measured omics data on top of it. And so this is, this is roughly the structure that I'll be following um, today. I'll start off with a little bit of introduction. What is omics data actually? So um, omics data comes in uh, when we talk about inherited traits. So essentially, we have like these three aspects here, inherited traits, the environment, and the phenotype. The phenotype is kind of the one thing that we really care about. That's like the appearance of an organism, like, the, like how we look, uh, our height, our behavior, our abilities, but also the diseases we get in, in many cases. So the phenotype uh, is really like the thing that we can observe. Um, and the phenotype is influenced by like, at least again, simplified to two different things uh, by our inherited, uh, inherited traits um, and by the environment. And in the inherited traits, we distinguish now between two different aspects, the genotype and epigenetics. And genotype is kind of like the more classical inherited um, aspect and epigenetics is the like more, let's say, complex, interesting, uh, more nuanced aspects that can also be passed on, but they can also be modified by the environment. 
An environment is anything that is like social influences, nutrition, education, accidents, exposure to some chemicals, uh, or even drug treatments. Um, and so all of those are in balance. Mostly uh, the phenotype is influenced by the environment and by inherited traits, but the environment can also influence the inherited traits, right? So for example, if you're exposed to radiation um, in the environment, that might change your genotype, at least in some of your cells. Or if you're exposed to significant long-term malnutrition, that may change your epigenetics and you could even pass it on to somebody um, in like some of your children. So it's, it's, it's as always in biology, a very complex picture, but this is kind of like a simplified um, perspective. And, and what we really like in omics data, we measure everything that is related to inherited traits. Uh, and omics is a shorthand for different branches of biology. So first we have the most common one that you think of is genomics, right? The study of gene sequences, but there's also proteomics, the study of proteins, metabolomics, the study of the metabolisms and metabolites, transcriptomics, the study of the transcription processes, epigenomics, the study of the supporting structure of the DNA, and so on. So there's plenty of other omics uh, pieces, but essentially like much of this comes down to data about um, inherited um, traits. And so why is understanding omics data important? Well, uh, we want to understand the fundamentals in biology. We want to understand how like certain cell cycles uh, happen, what leads to aging, what leads to cancer, and so on. We want to understand omics to uh, be able to better do disease prevention. We want to be able to do targeted diagnosis. So for example, if we have certain mutations in the genome, uh, we know that those cause um, for example, cancer or some other disease. And if we can diagnose this early, we can take preventative measure um, or we can kind of like um, intervene after um, a disease has um, broken out with more, like essentially with more precision like we do in personalized medicine. So we wanna kind of look at what's the genetic profile of a person and then give them the perfect medication for that particular genetic profile. Uh, of course, drug development is a big issue. So you want to like typically in a drug inhibits something in a biological process. Um, and so to do that, you need to understand what's going on in that biological process. Um, and then there's also, of course, targeted modification of organisms. We do like a fair bit of this nowadays for let's say plants, uh, but it's like with CRISPR, especially it's it, like we can uh, create medications. We can even like modify uh, like humans um, based on like understanding omics data and modifying it. And so it, it's kind of useful to like, uh, I'm assuming that people here don't like have not a ton of uh, inform, like knowledge about bio uh, biology beyond let's say high school biology, but this is kind of like what a typical gene would look like if we, if we took like a 2000s perspective. So we have like the, the DNA, the genome sequence, and then we have on that sequence, the, the important bits here are these like exons. These are the coding regions. Uh, and then in between we have uh, introns or promoter regions. Uh, like it's not that important, but essentially those exons in the gene are, are where like most of the coding information uh, is contained. And those exons are then um, translated into mRNA um, and to together make up kind of like the, the genetic sequence. The modern gene is a little bit more complicated. So we have these primary transcripts that I'm just mentioning here, but they, they can also be spliced. Um, these can be translated into different functional products. Um, and depending on, on like your perspective, genes can be like much more complicated than it, it initially appears. And so the, 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 this is kind of like the classical figure, like what, how does actually DNA influence what we're doing? Um, what, what happens is uh, DNA is copied off via RNA synthesis in, in the transcription process into RNA, and RNA is then translated into the protein synthesis process into proteins, and proteins do most of the things that, um, uh, that we care about in our bodies. So for example, uh, proteins uh, provide structural support for our body. They store amino acids to transport other substance, substances. They coordinate all of our the activities in, in an organism. They, um, they provide responses of cells to chemical stimuli. They kind of like move around. They protect against the diseases. And they can selectively accelerate or slow down chemical reactions. So protein, proteins are really like the thing that makes stuff happen in, in organisms. And so 
like just from like a purely human perspective, uh, understanding omics data is important because it has such an uh, such a massive impact on health. So this is kind of like a figure of the causes of death in the United States from 2011. And so you see heart disease and cancer are the main um, causes of death. And if we kind of like look at which of those um, which of those kind of like causes of death are significantly influenced by uh, genetic aspects, we can see that heart disease to some degree is influenced to like, uh, but not quite as much as cancer. Cancer is like a very much a genetic disease. And so obviously um, that is like a, a big deal. Um, and then things like stroke or Alzheimer's is, is, is genetic or diabetes is genetic. We have kidney related diseases. I didn't mark suicide here as genetic, but we actually now know that suicide also has large genetic components. So like essentially genetic data and omics data um, are really, really like understanding them is really, really important for many, uh, many aspects of human health. And so like, okay, so now I hope I've convinced you that um, understanding omics data is important for like uh, human health, but also for basic, bio, uh, understand, basic understanding of biology. Uh, why do we need visualization? Um, well, it turns out biology is in the middle of a revolution. We are like, it's being transformed and like it's pretty far along uh, this process already. It's being transformed from a wet lab experimental to a computational science. Uh, and the challenge in molecular biology is really now shifting from like data acquisition, which was kind of like the hot topic in the 2000s, um, to data processing and analysis. So data, genomic data is really now free and ubiquitous. So you can essentially, um, like if you have just a little bit of money, you can get so much data that you don't really know what to do with it. Um, and like the most, the most telling figure here is this cost per genome. Uh, here, I'd like notice that the y-axis is the logarithmic scale. Back in 2001, when the Human Genome Project was started, uh, it cost about like $100 million to sequence a single genome. Uh, that cost has dropped significantly and very quickly. Um, this figure is a little bit outdated. It's like 2013, but you can see that even in 2013, sequencing a full human genome uh, was on the order of like a couple of thousand dollars. Now it's probably on the order of a thousand dollars. So, uh, and this is like, this drop is even faster than Moore's law, like the, the law we use in computing to uh, measure how many transistors we can fit on a chip. And this is just like an illustration of how cheap and ubiquitous genomic data is nowadays. And so what does this mean? We can now do very large experiments. So for example, the Cancer Genome Atlas um, so did like a full uh, sequencing analysis and collected many other types of omics data for thousands of patients from different can like had, who suffered from different types of cancer and collected them and then made them publicly available. Um, similar, the ENCODE project did sequence many different organisms. So there's like this ubiquity of uh, omics data um, and, and we need to like use smart visualization and of course bioinformatics and machine learning algorithms to make sense of these data sets. And, and so it turns out the analysis of genomic data is actually pretty hard. So the genome is huge. Um, on that genome, we have about 20,000 coding coding genes, which is only corresponds to 1.5% of the genome. We have about 3 billion base pairs. Um, and, and we kind of like have this cascade from like something is a gene, then it's translated to a protein that it exhibits a certain function. Um, but each of these steps is actually influenced by many processes, like by all of the different omics that I can measure. And it's this very complex interplay of many different functional aspects. So, and I wanna like just go back to this kind of like, um, division into these three um, aspects, the sequence uh, aligned, the structural perspective, then the tablet perspective, and then the network perspective, and want to dive into the first uh, sequence aligned genome browser structural perspective. So when we talk about sequence aligned data, uh, the, some of the tasks that we care about are is identifying structural variations or browsing annotations and map experimental data or comparing sequences. And I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean with structural variation and so on. Um, but this data acquisition uh, happens via genome sequencing, right? This happens via these like uh, machines where I put in a tissue sample and then they spit out some kind of like 
probabilistic uh, view of what your genome uh, looks like. And then you can look at that, you can see whether there are any mutations, any deviations, and so on. There's many, many different um, data acquisition techniques, and I'm not going to go into them, uh, but just know that we, we have like pretty good uh, ways of uh, analyzing this kind of data nowadays. And so the thing that we care a lot about is structural variability. Uh, because structural variability is both an indicator for disease, but it's also like an indicator for natural variation that happens in humans or in any organism. Uh, and there's different types of structural variability that, change, that, that we have different names for depending on their scale mostly. So we have chromosomal alterations, we have copy number variation, we have mutations, and we have SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms. And I'll talk about those in a little bit more detail. So the biggest one and the one that we've been understanding for like a long time, because you can more or less see it under a microscope, uh, is our chromosomal alterations. This is uh, like when you have missing or duplicate chromosomes. A very common uh, condition that, that you might know about is trisomy 21, which used to be called Down syndrome. Uh, this is the most common uh, chromosomal alterations um, in humans. Uh, there's like many, actually many other chromosomal defects. Uh, they are just as common, but most other chromosomal, def chromosomal defects are fatal for embryos. So the figure on the right just shows um, that like the whole process of inception and, and bringing a child to term is, is very error prone. And like if there is a, an, an, a problem with like chromosomal alterations, um, like the embryo is most likely not to survive. Um, a smaller, smaller scale structural variation are these copy number variation. You, like a, a rough definition would be this affect everything that's more than one kilo base, so one, more than 1,000 bases. Um, there is no clear boundary to chromosomal alterations in the upper end. Um, but what happens in copy number variations, you can have, for example, multiple copies of a certain region of your genome, or you can ha have deleted um, in, in uh, one uh, chromosome, or it could be deleted in both chromosomes. So you have like heterozygous or homozygous deletions. And this kind of leads to increased or decreased activity uh, uh, of these particular, for example, genes, uh, but can also be loss of function. So let's suppose you have, um, let's say, multiple copies of a gene um, that, like I'm making something up here, that regulates um, whatever, uh, obesity, uh, maybe like if you have multiple copies of this gene, like that is a, that is a particularly uh, intense problem for you. Mutations are what we colloquially think, or colloquially think about uh, alterations in the genome. Um, and like for mutations, we, we often call them like point mutations. There's like, it, there could be like a different base in a single location. And there, there we have like a couple of different types. They could be silent if they're like not relevant. Uh, if we have, if you decode for the same or sufficiently similar amino acid, it could be a missense mutation which code for different amino acid. Amino acids are the like building blocks of proteins. And then it could be nonsense mutations which code for a stop and can truncate a protein. And in that case, the protein could also not be functional. Um, there could also be insertions uh, for mutations. So we have where you have a couple of extra bases or deletions where you're missing one or more bases or insertion deletions or inversions. Um, and these mutations are actually fairly common in our genome there is like about 30,000 in like a typically healthy human. Uh, and of course, mutations are um, what is underlying human or any kind of evolution. Um, and so some mutations can eventually be beneficial. Some mutations don't matter. Some mutations are natural variation. Some mutations lead to diseases. Um, so uh, for example, cystic fibrosis is um, uh, based on like a mutation in the CFTR gene or uh, in cancer, we know that the BRCA genes, the BRCA1 and 2 um, are like a particular mutation of the BRCA gene. Uh, genes can lead to breast cancer or like a particular mu mutation of IDH1 can lead to brain cancer. So understanding these mutations is of course important. And then the last, structural variation are these single nucleotide polymorphism. And these are kind of like um, switched like variations in, in kind of like what is going on in a particular sequence. Um, these are natural, they're not necessarily diseased phenomena. They occur 
every like thousand to two thousand base pairs, and, and they're not they're, they're responsible for the natural phenotypical variation between organisms. So that's why we don't look all the same, right? We don't all have the same um, like hair color and so on, uh, because we have this this single nucleotide polymorphisms, and typically we distinguish between SNPs. Um, and mutations um, if we observe these SNPs commonly in the population. Otherwise, we would call it as a point mutation. But if you see that like 10% of the population have a T instead of an A at this particular point, then we would call this a SNP. If this is kind of extremely rare, we would call it a mutation. But of course, um, like they, uh, they kind of define the traits of organisms. Uh, they can also play roles in diseases. So for example, Alzheimer is known uh, to be affected by particular combinations of SNPs. And so now let's talk a little bit about um, visualizing this kind of structural data. Um, what, we, what we frequently do is we want to browse genomes. And, and what we do here is we have like a reference sequence uh, and then we put uh, like annotations on top of this reference sequence. So uh, for example, um, in, in our reference sequence genome browser, we would know that this particular region codes for that gene, uh, or this particular region promotes translation for that gene. Um, but then we can also have experimental data that we put on top of such a sequence. So for example, gene expression data measures the activity, like how much of a, uh, of a functional product, a protein, for example, is being produced by a certain gene. That's what I measure with gene expression data. And I could overlay that on the sequence uh, to visualize it. And then of course I could like have my reference genome, which is kind of like this consensus genome. Um, and then I can show the genotype variation here. So for what are the mutations, what are the copy number variations and so on. Uh, and typically this is based on, on tracks. So you have like one track that visualizes the reference genome maybe, uh, and then you have like these additional tracks that visualize data on top of it. And at this point, I wanna to point to um, the, this, this great state-of-the-art report by um, like a speaker that you had on Monday, and he is Galenborg. He just recently, and his, he and his group um, uh, with Sabrina Nostrad and Teresa Harbig, they did this, uh, this uh, very nice paper about different types of genome visualizations. And so I just want to point to this. Um, I, I don't want to go into the details here. Um, I'll, I'll pick out some of those, but if you're interested in genome visualization, this is definitely the paper that you should take a look at. So this is what a typical genome browser looks like. Um, and it's actually like not a very pretty one. And there's lots of like weird visualization stuff uh, going on in this one, but it is a very, very popular one. This is the US UCSC genome browser. Um, and, and what you see here is like at the very top here, like let me point something here. Like at the very top here, oops. Okay, I'm gonna not do that. At the very top, you see uh, kind of like a, a rough like where like location. You're in the chromosome 21. Um, you like have these genome coordinates, uh, and then you have these different um, these different tracks here that um, show you like here is a gene. Here are like sequence uh, SMPs. There is like human mRNAs and so on. Um, and and then I uh, in this case here, there's like overlaid activity data. So you can see like what is going on for like a particular experiment. Um, and, and so then you have other tracks. And so you see a C genome browser is, is like a, a, really, um, a really great resource. And it's, it's like not the best visualization, but it is really great because it has so many uh, data sources connected to it. Right? So lots of people really like using it because basically like every uh, public data set can easily be integrated. So that's like one of those uh, examples where like just making it easy to integrate data um, it led to the success of the tool. Um, another very commonly used genome browser is the Integrative Genome Viewer, which is developed by the Broad Institute. Uh, here is like a screenshot of that. You have like your kind of like a chromosome depiction at the top. You see uh, roughly have some orientation of where you are in the chromosome um, with the red markers there. And then you have multiple tracks that show you activity data or single nucleotide polymorphisms. And then down there, like the big box, the data tracks, the NGS reads, they're like actual reads from a sequencing machine. 
Um, and so that's like a desktop tool um, that it, that has like some uh, like pretty sophisticated visualization. Um, and so that's definitely worth looking at if you're interested in visualizing genome uh, gen uh, genomic data in a genome browser. Um, and so in summary, genome browsers are good if you need high resolution data um, and you want to can be, kind of be able to get an overview, but also drill down to single nucleotides. Um, they are also good if your task is um, makes sense if you have like this this kind of like linear structure of the genome if you have if you're orienting yourself based on a chromosome but they can be problematic if because they they don't really capture functional relationships right just because something is located close to each other on the genome doesn't mean that they have functional relationships um, and so it is really useful for structural aspects uh, but uh, it's it's like for example if I want to understand gene expression data it might not be the best approach um, and uh, sequences are like the sequence of uh, a genome is primarily interested for like evolution and structure, but not for function. And for function, we have different approaches. Um, and so if you wanted to visualize structural, um, structural variations, um, so for example, if like some translocations that happen in the genome, there's a couple of different ways you could do that. This is based on a paper by Sidney Nielsen. Um, so like, and, and this is, you will find those in, in like, if this, these, uh, this classification is really like, you will find one of them is, is how, how people choose to show um, translocations or structural variations in genomes. So first is you could have the two sequences um, like next to each other um, and you could uh, show a translocation by an arc. Um, the second one here would be that you do this with an arc, but you show uh, like, but you lay out the, uh, the sequence in a circular layout and that makes the curves, the connections a little bit easier. Um, the, the third option C here is showing the translocation, like, um, like actually showing the translocation and co color coding it in the chromosome. So here you would have J followed by K prime and then K followed by J prime. That would be like the translocation. Uh, and then D, you could show this translocation in a dot plot. So you have like the reference on the X axis and the variant on the Y axis. Uh, that is like sometimes difficult to read, but can be a very effective encoding if you know how to read it. Or you can do a nonlinear encoding using a graph. So the dash here would be the original, the solid would be uh, the changed uh, translocation. And so this is roughly like what you see in all of the different ways of depicting translocation. Uh, and these like radial diagrams with arcs are very common. Um, this is like a, a circus plot. And so the, the circus plot plots like a genome. In this case, we see all chromosomes here. Uh, and in the middle, it shows these translocations or these kind of like any other kinds of uh, structural connections uh, with, with arcs. Uh, but for each of the uh, like segments or for each of the genomes, there's also data tracks that show you some additional data, like what, what is that, that function in that region of the chromosome and so on. And so circus plots are very popular in publications. Um, they tend to be a little bit hard to read. Um, they have, a, uh, they're also kind of like, they're, they're a static plot, right? They're like illustrative. They're not all that great for, let's say, looking at details, you can't interactively zoom in and so on. Uh, an example of a linear layout is this gremlin tool. Um, here you essentially have genome coordinates and you see these arcs on top of each other showing some structural variations, uh, translocations mostly. Um, and this is like also an example of an interactive tool. So here you could actually zoom in and look at the particular gene at a particular region of interest and see its relationship with uh, other pieces in the genome. Um, and then um, the other thing that is very often int of interest, if we if you look at if you take a structural perspective, is comparing between species because uh, conservation of uh, genomic sequences and species indicates that something is functionally relevant, right? So like there's a lot more variation between species in um, in in the genome in genomic regions that are not all that relevant uh, for for life. But uh, things that, that govern basic, let's say, cell cycles are, are very, very common across many different species. And so I want to show this quick video about this dual MISB um, that enables this comparison between species.
Can you all hear the sound? No, we don't hear sound so far. Showing all of the conserved genomic features. Now we do. MISB incorporates a variety of visual cues and interaction mechanisms that allow biologists to understand four different relationship types, proximity, size, orientation, and similarity. The high-level genome view shows a circular overview of all source chromosomes on the outer ring with the destination chromosomes on the inner ring. Selecting a source chromosome highlights it in black, and a copy of it also appears inside. We encode the syntonic relationship using connection with B spline curves linking the matched blocks colored by the destination chromosome using a repeating eight element color map. The colors also provide an overview of all block destinations in the outer source genome ring. We can flip through the source chromosomes with left and right arrow keys or using mouse clicks. Our version of edge bundling is based on block contiguity and destination chromosome, making the location of spurious blocks more obvious. Changing the curve transparency makes the strongest connections stand out. We move the two triangles to filter the blocks in this view and in the chromosome view. Selecting a chromosome updates the chromosome view in the middle, which shows block locations in more detail. We can flip through the blocks with mouse clicks or using okay. the up and down arrow key. I don't want to show the whole video, but you get the idea. So uh, you have kind of like, you show two species, like one in the outside ring, one in the inside ring, um, and you show the conserved regions between the chromosome of the one species to the other species uh, and with these connection lines. And that shows you some structural variation in the genome. OK, so now um, I want to move on to talk a little bit about tabular data visualization. And tabular data visualization is really about like the abundance of some omics data types, such as gene expression, protein expression, methylation, which is like an epigenetic um, omics um, data set, data type. Um, and typically, we measure this via microarrays or like deep sequencing. So again, I'm not going to go into the details here, uh, but there's like many different uh, ways of acquiring this kind of data. And typically what we want to do is we want to um, do things like compare different conditions or di compare different kind of like, um, let's say people or organisms and so on. And so some of the tasks would be to identify shared function of genes. That's kind of like some of the uh, like first uses that people have done with uh, clustering genomics, uh, gene, uh, gene expression data. So for example, uh, similar regulation um, in uh, like similar gene expression can indicate functional relationships. So for example, if you set, if you sample, let's say liver cells um, and, uh, and you find that there is a set of uh, genes that are co-regulated uh, that might mean that they're, they're, uh, uh, they're involved in the same process. Um, it could also be that you want to compare regulation or activity of genes between different conditions. So uh, for example, you could say, hey, here I have like people that are treated with, with drug A, here's people that are treated with, with no drug. Um, what are their differences? Like how does their genome activity change? Or you might, might want to identify subtypes. Um, for example, different regulation in, in one disease can reveal subtypes. And this is like very common, for example, to look at cancer subtypes to, for, to enable precision medicine, to look at which, what is kind of like the, the, the expression pattern of this person. Uh, and that can help us to classify what kind of disease they have, what exact kind of disease they have, and that might um, help us pick the right treatment, for example. Uh, and so, um, yeah, mostly what, what happens here is that we have tabular data in the end. Um, and, and frequently, like it, it can be heterogeneous or homogeneous data. But essentially, the scale of a table here really matters uh, for picking the right approach. We need kind of different approaches for like smaller or normal size tables and high dimensional tables. So for example, if you have about 50 dimensions, you can probably just do like a visualization method to do that. But if you have thousands of dimensions, you need to combine your visualization method with some analytics uh, to make sense. 
it also depends on how many records do you have. If you have like thousand, like about a thousand records, like rows in a table, using just visualization is fine. If you have way more than ten thousand rows, you probably need something analytical in top to filter it out or to aggregate or to summarize or something like that. And then homogeneity ma ma matters a lot too for picking the right type of data visualization technique. Is it the same data type or is it the same scale? So here is like an example of a heterogeneous table, the first one, and a homogeneous table, the second one. Um, so the first one is I'm looking at one particular gene, like EGFR, which is like a uh, known to be mutated uh, and has child copy number alterations in, in uh, many cancers. Uh, and so I can measure gene expression of that gene. Uh, I can measure copy number status. So I have like one or three copies or I can measure like a particular mutation and that could be a categorical attribute, yes or no, right? Um, and so if I have something like this where I have three different data types in the table, I need to pick a very different visualization from, than when I have something like at the bottom where I have um, the same data type on the same scale, just for different, in this case, genes. So here I have like gene expression for EGFR, BRCA and TNF, for example, for different people. And so, Depending on what your data is, you have to pick different visualization techniques. Um, and I like to think of uh, um, kind of like the spectrum of how much analytics do you need um, for tabular visualizations. On the left is the like no or little analytics there where you have like scatter plot matrix, matrices or parallel coordinates. In the middle, we have these like very classical heat maps that, that only really make sense if you, if you do clustering um, but you can still interpret and see the raw data. And on the right, you have uh, things like dimensionality reduction approaches uh, where you really have this very strong analytic com component and really only judge the output of the algorithms. Um, and so I'm gonna dive into some of those a little bit. Um, I just wanna point, and I'm not gonna go into the details here, but I, I really like this kind of overview for tabular data that somebody at the Financial Times um, created. And this is kind of like a, a guideline on like which tabular visualization technique is useful for which kinds of uh, tasks. Um, and yeah, I'll make the slides available later, take a look at this. Uh, it's kind of a useful guideline if you like use a charting library, for example, uh, and you say, hey, I wanna show correlation, what are my options? And you can look at the chart and see the different options that you have. Alex, sorry to interrupt. We have a couple questions in the Discord channel. Sure. Um, do you want me to read them to you? Yeah. Sure. So the first question is, what kind of visualization are they using to study the genome? And the, the second one, which might be related, is which are the analytical methods to represent the dimensions and the records in a table? Yeah, so I'll go into this a little bit. There's um, two main, uh, like the second for the second question, the analytic methods, we'll talk about clustering and we'll talk about um, multidimensional scaling, PCA and, and other like dimensionality reduction methods um, in, in just a second. Uh, the first question is, is pretty broad, right? Uh, so basically everything I'm talking about today and much, much more, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, all right, thanks. <laughs> sure. Okay, so um, I wanna just talk one second uh, about the topic that I think is kind of fairly obvious, but it's, it's easy to get wrong. And so I just wanna mention this. Uh, when we do, when we first look at data sets, we use some, like a tablet data sets, we usually use some kind of aggregate representations. Typically, like I think about it as histograms. So instead of showing all data points, we show a data distribution. That's a compact representation. Uh, you always have to look at more detail because the data might not be well behaved, but if it's well behaved, then these compact representations are quite useful. Um, and so the typical histogram is, is, is it looks like something like this, right? Uh, so a histogram essentially creates um, bins and counts how many entries in your data set fall into that pin. bin. Um, and um, so that's a very useful way of like taking a first look at your data. So you should like always take a hit, start out with a histogram and then and then dive deep, deeper. There's some challenges. The good number of bins are hard to predict. My typical recommendation is play around with it or make it interactive. There's some rules of thumb how you, how you pick your number of bins. Um, I don't wanna go into too much detail here, um, but you can certainly see um, differences. Like here we have this two same data sets and we see like this artifact that we, um, we missed uh, on the far left in the first plot, uh, which we can see in, in, the, in the bottom plot here. 
um, the uh, kind of more advanced version of, of um, histograms are these kernel density estimates. Um, and they are like essentially just like a continuous function. Um, again, I don't want to go into the details. I actually provide a link in my slides here to a very nice interactive explainer how these kernel density estimates work. Uh, and and they're like a super uh, a super useful technique to give you like a, a rough overview of your data set as well. Um, I wanted to mention box plots uh, because box plots are very common. But um, the problem is that box plots tend to not show us uh, like reliably different kinds of distributions. So box plots are great for showing data that is roughly normal distributed, but they're really bad at showing things like bimodal or peaked or skewed distribution. So like this is one box plot and in the histograms, you can actually see that these are very different distributions, but the box plot is always the same. Uh, and what you should use instead, if you want to use a box plot, you should use a violin plot. And violin plots used to be hard to make, but now most of the charting libraries out there support them. And in violin plots, this is just basically like a kernel density estimate um, and then flipped. Uh, so you, you have like a, a good sense of, of the distribution. Um, and um, these violin plots really can show you like more subtle variations in the distribution. So for example, the green one here shows us a bimodal distribution, which is just not shown in a box plot at all. So my recommendation would be like, if you're ever tempted to use a box plot, just use a violin plot instead. Uh, and here's this nice graphic that essentially shows you um, if I have raw data um, and if I vary it, like you see in this animation, the box plot still remains exactly the same, but the violin plots really capture that variation very well. Okay, so um, then I want to talk a little bit about how can we visualize correlation, correlation? How do two or more variables behave relative to each other? Um, and the obvious choice here would be like a scatter plot. We have two orthogonal axes visualizing one dimension each. Of course, we have questions, how do we encode the mark? How do we deal with many data points and so on? Um, but these are all kind of like things that uh, people have thought about. So scatter plots are really great for showing correlation between two, um, two dimensions. If I have more than two dimensions, I can use scatter plot matrices. And that's very, uh, like a very useful, like first glance at like beyond what like you see in a histogram. Is there any kind of obvious pattern in my data sets? Um, here, each row uh, or column is one dimension and each cell plots a scatter plot of two dimensions. And so what I'm showing here is this classical machine learning data set, the IRIS data set, um, and you can see that we, we have some, some patterns um, that we can spot in, in that scatter plot matrix. But of course, scatter plot matrices, they don't really work if I have, um, let's say, a genome scale um, number of dimensions. That just would be way too many. Uh, and then another very common uh, pair, like multi dimensional data visualization technique or tablet data visualization uh, technique are parallel coordinates. Here, axes represent uh, attributes or dimensions, and lines connecting an axes represent items. So here we have um, like two points A and B in our scatter plot on the left. Um, and how we do this in a parallel chorus plot is we, we essentially um, make like a, a virtual tick at each of the axes for that particular row. What's the corresponding value? And then we connect uh, this. Um, um, these, these ticks of the same row across all of the different axes. And so here we see, for example, that A is high in X, but low in Y, and B is low in X and high in Y. And the nice thing about this is we can add more axes, and then we can get an overall picture of them. And so this is this, um, um, this is like a nice interactive implementation of a, of a, uh, of a parallel coordinates plot. Um, this is like a, Car, the cars data set from like the 80s or so. Um, you see fuel economy, the number of cylinders, displacement, horsepower, and so on. Um, and I can see some patterns, right? I can see that, let's say, weight and acceleration here seem to be inversely correlated. So the, the higher the weight, the lower the acceleration. Uh, and if I wanted to look at something in a little bit more detail, I could use interactivity to brush certain elements. And now I can actually judge the the very heavy cars across all of the different dimensions. And so we see these parallel coordinates frequently uh, used in, in genomic data analysis. 
Um, another way is like a tabular representation. Um, so here, think of it as like a, a spreadsheet, but here you show each, um, instead of just showing the numbers in the spreadsheet, you could use uh, visual marks and then you could use interactivity such as sorting uh, and, and filtering and so on to like analyze the data set. I'm linking a video here. I'm again, not playing this uh, because of time, but if you're interested in that kind of stuff, take a look at this. This is actually um, a, an example of a tabular visualization that is be that is kind of like uh, commercialized by my startup company. So it's just so you know that there's like a, uh, for full disclosure, uh, but this is like actually a, a Omics application here. And I would say the most common tabular representation in for omics data are these pixel-based displays or heat maps, uh, where each cell is a pixel and the color value is, um, or the value is encoded in color or color value. Um, the thing is that ordering is really important here for the interpretation. So the, the heat map on the right uh, that you see here, like uh, the, the left version is not ordered. Um, so like you cannot actually see any patterns here, right? So that's really like almost impossible to pick out anything that just looks like random noise. But if I use smart ordering um, and the order smart ordering usually means clustering um, in, in, in the bio context, then we suddenly see, oh, wow, there seem to be like very distinct clusters, very distinct patterns. There's this red block uh, at the bottom and there's this red block at the, block at the top. Um, the thing is that they are also very scalable. So I can look at like large scale genomic data um, and that's why they are very, very frequently used. Uh, and on, on the figure on the right shows you a comparison of like a heat map uh, and uh, a parallel coordinates plot for the same data set. And you can see that the clusters are apparent in both, but maybe they're a little bit more apparent for like an untrained eye in the heat map. So, uh, I mentioned clustering a lot. Um, and again, this is like a, a huge topic. Uh, clustering is, is really a classification of items into similar bins. And you have to do this based on some uh, similarity measure. And there's different types of algorithms uh, and different like parameterizations of algorithms. Uh, the hierarchical algorithms are particularly interesting in biology because they, they produce these similarity trees and dendrograms um, that you commonly see. Uh, and so here would be an example of like a, a large clustered heat map. Um, so this is actually like a full scale uh, genomic data set. Um, we are looking at 500 patients and 2000 genes. Uh, and so this might be even sub pixel uh, resolution, uh, but you can still see some patterns. You can still see very clearly this data set exhibits clusters. We can, we can recognize patterns what exactly they are, what, why they are meaningful. That's like a different question that there we again need some more sophisticated methods, but they're quite useful to get an initial sense. Um, and if you compare this um, to parallel coordinates, like uh, the parallel coordinates just can't keep up at that scale, right? There's just way too many dimensions. Um, so that's not a particularly useful plot here, uh, but the heat map uh, or these pixel dis displays are very scalable. Um, and so um, here, I just wanted to mention hierarchical clustering again, because they create these dendrograms. And, and this like the figure on the right is like the, the classical uh, cluster heat map, which is like from this paper by Michael Eisen. Um, and, and they what they did is essentially they applied this, these hierarchical clustering algorithms. Um, and, and the hierarchical clustering algorithm gives you a similarity tree. It's like, what is the for each row or dimension, what is the most similar other row? Uh, and those are connected with this little tree. Um, and so then you could kind of like at some point partition or slice that tree and say, this is now my discrete cluster. Um, and that's kind of like a very nice way of seeing how similar two clusters um, and, of, and at the same time, it gives you a good ordering um, and it, it's kind of like makes a ton of sense um, to be used with kind of like gene expression data at that scale. Um, here is an example of like taking this a little bit further with an interactive system. Like you have uh, like a scaled out version on the left where you have this dendrogram showing a similarity tree and then like an intermediate zoomed in version and then a detailed version where you can actually read um, off individual gene names um, and look at which clusters they fall in for which experiments. Um, I would caution against using these heat maps for heterogeneous data. Um, 
for heterogeneous data, like here we see, uh, uh, this is from a published paper, um, each of these um, rows is actually a different data type. So they're very difficult to interpret. Um, and, and so you like the red in the second row does actually not mean the same as the red in the third row. Um, so just be a little bit careful um, to use heat maps when you have heterogeneous data. Um, there's some other problems with heat maps. They um, clearly like there is um, the problem of uh, color vision deficiencies. So for example, red green heat maps that used to be the, the, the reference standard back in the 2000s. And now I think are like people have recognized that this is a problem, but if you use a red green uh, color map, you actually lose like a fair bit of the population cannot accurately interpret your um, charts because red green weakness is very common. So if you look at this um, highlighted cluster here or this highlighted region here um, on the left, uh, if you had uh, red green blindness, you would actually not see that there is the significant variation between red and green uh, in that particular cluster. Um, and similarly, um, uh, if you instead use the red blue color map, that would be very apparent to somebody who has a color um, vision deficiency. So red blue is, is always a good default for a heat map. Uh, the other thing that you have to be aware of that color is relative. Uh, so like the example here on the like far left shows that those two smaller rectangles in the middle of the large rectangles, they appear to be of different color, but in fact are the same color. Whereas in the second column, the, um, the, the smaller rectangles appear to be of the same color when in fact they're of the different color. And that's because of their surrounding color. Um, and like bringing this back to heat maps, um, the two fields that I've started here actually have the same color, but one appears much darker than the other one uh, because of its surroundings, right? So we, we always judge this in, uh, in, in relative terms, color. And so it, it's a little bit tricky. You have to be careful when you interpret it. Uh, so I showed this already. Um, I wanted to show this example here quickly. And while well, I guess in, in terms of time, here's, I've linked a video here that shows how this is used in um, in, in um, like cancer subtype analysis, how these kinds of processes are used in cancer subtype analysis. And so again, I'll refer to the slides. If you're interested, you can take a look at how an interactive system would use this um, to analyze cancer subtypes. Um, the last tabular um, aspect that I wanna talk about is dimensionality reduction. Here, like the idea is to have, like you take like a high dimensional table and reduce it to lower dimensional space. And you want to preserve as much of the like structure variations or patterns in the data set as possible. And then you can plot the lower dimensional space. The classical approach to this would be principal component analysis, but there's many different more sophisticated methods out there now. Um, the, the problem with uh, all these techniques is that um, essentially like they show similarity between items, but they don't show the raw data. And because they are reduced, uh, there are like there's potential for problems, issues, and artifacts. Um, so just because two items are close to each other in a in a reduced like in a in a in a projected plot doesn't mean that they are actually similar, but it could be that they're similar. And so you always have to check. So this is an example of here. It looks like this is like a text uh, visualization example. Here it looks like. Um, petroleum engineering dissertations, uh, the blue in a, the blue circle in, at the bottom here, um, are more similar to neurobiology than, let's say, to electrical engineering. Uh, and, and it turns out that this is just an artifact of the dimensionality reduction algorithm, which you can resolve with interactivity, for example. Uh, and here you see distances to petroleum engineering for all of these different topics, and you see that all of the engineering discipline, disciplines tend to be fairly similar. Uh, the more fancy algorithms uh, that people use nowadays, especially in genomics, are things like T-SNE and T-distributed stochastic neighborhood embedding. Um, it, here, it's, it's really important to not judge distances, but really just judge uh, neighborhoods. Um, and there's like, these are slightly difficult to interpret. And so there's like guidelines out there on how to use these new and advanced algorithms and how to also read them 
uh, and what they mean. Uh, and these are very good interactive um, articles that I would really recommend that you should take a look at if you're interested. Uh, and, and just so uh, you can see an example of what this looks like for omics data, this is from a nature paper that shows like uh, a T-SNE plot um, and then um, takes the same T-SNE plot and, plot and color codes it in three different uh, versions. So like overlaying categorical aspects and you see that, for example, the red and blue are nicely separated in this T-SNE plot. This is like, I don't know exactly what the bio biology here is behind it, but it kind of shows that T-SNE has revealed something that is biologically relevant here. Okay. This is kind of a whirlwind of things, um, but yeah, it's such a big uh, area. Um, I just wanted to, like, I'm not going to probably finish this. I just wanted to give you a little bit of an, uh, a hint at what is going on with systems biology in the network perspective. Uh, and that's really important to understand how do things interact with each other. So suppose we, we have like the metabolic process, which is like chemical reactions that do things like convert food to energy or food to the building blocks of our cells so that we can grow. Um, that's all captured in metabolic processes. Um, and similarly, we have signaling processes. This is like cells response to signal and coordinate functions. So for example, if we like in an early development stage, if we like the body tells an embryo to grow a finger that happens in a signaling process. Um, and we can kind of like have to understand omics data in the context of these processes to understand what happens if we change something in the process. Um, and so what happens is we, we kind of like, we have these networks and these networks are curated, they're studied. This is like a very like tedious process to really understand what's going on. Um, and then they are published in, in various databases. So here we see like a signal, uh, signaling, signaling pathway from, from Keck. This is like a Japanese pathway project about cell death. Um, and that explains what is going on, which genes, which proteins are interacting um, to like facilitate cell death. Um, and now, uh, like if you wanted to understand, is this process somehow going wrong in a particular disease or particular process, we would have to overlay that with uh, omics data. And, and what, we, what we essentially have to do is we have to visualize networks and attributes at the same time, because the attributes can influence the, the topology of the networks. For example, a path can be uh, slowed down or blocked. Um, for example, if you were to like, take a, um, an example from like um, our daily lives is, is the best route when you're driving from one point to the other depends on traffic, right? So that's like a multivariate network problem. But similarly in biological networks, if you wanna like facilitate cell growth, um, that if that whole pathway is upregulated, that might lead to uncontrolled cell growth, which is cancer, right? So you need to understand the regulation of these networks to understand many diseases. And the challenge here is that we have many data values um, and then we have multiple groups in condition and we have different types of data and we need to all map this onto, uh, onto networks. Um, so we need to both explore the topology and explore the attributes of the nodes. Um, and uh, doing both of that at the same time is actually fairly tricky. Um, and so like here, if you have those two tables and you wanna map all of those to these networks, it is actually not that easy to do. Uh, and people have tried many different things. The most common one is of course, color coding, um, but here's like an overview of different approaches. Uh, you can use matrices uh, with adjacent tables. Uh, you can use Arnold encoding with little bar charts on top of it. You can use small multiples, you can use multiple views, or you can use some specialized techniques, which I call layer adaption. Um, here, I want to refer to that uh, report, the state of the art report that, uh, that a student of mine wrote with some collaborators and, and myself uh, that kind of like classifies all of these different approaches. Um, and they're very relevant for like systems biology applications. Um, just the last thing I want to say is like the most classical one is color coding. Um, so you see that frequently on top of these networks um, and um, or you show little charts on top of networks uh, to kind of like make people understand this. And so um, I'm out of time. Um, there's a couple of more slides, but I have covered the most important aspects, I think. Um, and I'm happy to make those slides available for reference and be available for uh, questions that you might have.
Great, thank you very much, Alex. Super informative sure. talk. There are a couple questions that popped up on um, Discord. So one was, um, let me see. What if you want to visualize variants, not only based on one reference, but related to all genomes or sequences in your analysis, like in pangenomics pan, pan or end-to-end -end comparisons? Yeah, so there are specialized approaches to that. Um, what you could do is you could have like a, more taking like a parallel coordinates approach, right? So you have like one axis for each genome and then put them next to each other. And th then you could show connection lines between them. Uh, that will show you like nice pairwise relationships. And if you reorder them, um, you could um, you could see various uh, relationships. So that, that's one approach. Um, pan genomes are hard, right? Because they like you, you, you like now suddenly you have so many different uh, data points, the dimensions. So it just gets the scale explodes. But but that would be like one one way to do it. Mm -hmm. Right. One other question is, do you use by clustering to detect subtypes? And if so, are there algorithms that you would recommend? Uh, well, by clustering is useful uh, if you really like. So by clustering uh, essentially reveals structure. Let's say we have uh, a data set with samples and with, with like gene expression. And if I don't know anything about the structure of my samples, like they are all of a population that I don't know anything about it, by clustering can be very useful, right? Then I can see there is these subtypes maybe in the samples and at the same time, I can also see it in the, uh, like the, the ordering of, of let's say genes. Uh, so yes, by clustering is useful. I don't have a particular recommendation for an algorithm. I would just use the implementations that the uh, environment that you're using uh, provides. I'm sure if you're using R, there's plenty of different um, implementations out there. If you're using uh, Python, there's like scikit-learn, obviously. Um, instead of bi-clustering, you can also just cluster both the dimensions and the records separately. That might not yield the best results. But if your environment doesn't have good bi-clustering algorithms, that would be an alternative. All right, thanks. And maybe one last question um, regarding TSNE and similar dimensionality reduction methods, how would you communicate to the user that the distances are not preserved? Do you think there are cases where one should simply avoid to use such methods? So, yeah, that's a good point. Um, I This is kind of like in, I think where, where uh, communication comes in, right? So here you should really be mindful and write good figure captions and explain what's going on. Um, I think that uh, these methods, like um, dimensionally reduction methods, just have um, they, they have the advantage of, of like really scaling down the problem. Like you can visually represent it very effectively in uh, a low dimensional paper. So there might be cases where this should be avoided, especially if it if you discover that you have kind of like sh you show patterns that are not actually there. Um, my recommendation would be just to be like in your analysis process, be mindful that the data, um, like the, the, the plot that you're generating actually represents something that you can verify with other means, then accurately describe it. And if it doesn't show um, real patterns, uh, then just don't use that plot or don't show it that way. I, I, don't, I know this is not a super satisfying answer, but there's like no hard rule of when to not use or when to use. Yeah. TCN or something like that. That makes sense. Thank you. Well, I would say for time reasons, let's stop our Q&A here. Thank you again, Alex, for your talk. It was really insightful. Um, we will take a break now and we'll be back in 11 minutes at 5.45. Uh, Alex, there are a couple more questions on Discord, so maybe you can check out the Discord channel and reply to those after sure, I'll do that. your talk. Thanks a lot. <laughs>